Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn with Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 20 of Arrow 3271. And today we're going to look at Euler Johnson columns. This plot to the right kind of summarizes how the strength of a part will transition from a stability failure to a block compression failure. We see the compressive strength plotted on the vertical axis and the slenderness ratio plotted on the horizontal axis, where the slenderness ratio is simply the effective length over the radius of gyration, because that radius of gyration includes both the area, which uh, works to minimize the effect of a force, and the moment of inertia, which is the resistance to bending. We see for large slenderness ratios that Euler buckling is the critical curve. And yet Euler buckling predicts too high of a value as you get shorter and shorter because other failure modes begin to dominate. We proposed a couple lectures ago that if we could transition from the Euler allowable curve to the block compression short slenderness ratio allowable, which for the shortest of sections will be FCU, and for a little, little bit longer sections, also very short, would be crippling. And we proposed a nice smooth transition. Let's take a look at that. So first we have the, this equation shown here for long columns. Euler buckling will be critical. Now that doesn't mean that Euler buckling is not effective for other shorter columns. What it means is it's just no longer critical. So once again, we're transitioning from the Euler equation, where that's effective, to where something else is effective. And yet we see that this curve goes too high because crippling will begin to dominate. So we've got the Euler equation shown by this green curve and actually crippling will begin to dominate for shorter sections. If they're thin, crippling will dominate. If they're thick, then it will be FCU that will dominate. And some people will end up using FCY rather than FCU in order to be conservative. And we proposed a simplified equation that transitioned from that Euler equation to whatever that compressive allowable is, which we see now is probably crippling. And this was the curve that we had. And so all we're going to do is take a baby step forward and plug in what we know now. We like this form of the curve, and yet now we know that the short buckling allowable is probably FCC. So if you plug into FCC into this equation, we find what we're going to call the Euler-Johnson equation, which has this form. What this means is we have a couple approaches we could do. One, we could just check both Euler buckling and crippling and just report the margin of safety on whichever one gives the smallest margin of safety or whichever one is most critical. Or we can just calculate the crippling allowable, plug directly into this Euler-Johnson equation, and that will tell us what the actual compressive buckling allowable is. Now you'll notice there's no information about FCU, so we will still need to cut this off by FCU. So you can actually do this by using this equation, which transitions smoothly from the Euler buckling allowable to the crippling allowable, and you will also need to check FCU and make sure that your compressive strength does not exceed that value. So the Euler-Johnson equation captures both crippling and buckling behavior in a single equation, and that's the beauty of it. That's the, all we're going to learn today. Let's go ahead and take a look at how this plays out on an example. So let's suppose we have a stringer like this one. This is a little angle stringer, and these are the dimensions, and it's attached to a thin skin. If we have the stringer property shown on the left, it looks like we have a titanium stringer. And we have the skin property shown on the right. Now, before we had 
the Euler buckling allowable, the FCU, and the crippling allowable, but now we can use Euler-Johnson to do a smooth transition. However, because we've also learned about effective widths, and we see that this stringer is attached to a thin sheet, we should begin to, to realize that we can improve our estimation of the compressive strength of this stringer if we account for however much skin is effective at working with the stringer. Remember, that was calculated based on the allowable of the stringer, which we could plug in as FCC or FCY. So that's what we're going to look at today. We see that the fasteners, the one shown here with the center line, is spaced at a pitch of 2 inches per fastener going into the page. And we're going to be looking for the compressive allowable. Since this thing's 18 inches long and it looks relatively uh, not super beefy. That means Euler buckling is a, is maybe critical. And because it's got thin, long, thin flanges constructing the section, that means crippling may be effective. And the Euler-Johnson equation will account for both of these failure modes. So what we first need to do is figure out FCC of the stiffener. We're going to do that in the way that we learned before. We're then going to calculate the effective width of the sheet. We're going to adjust that if it needs to be adjusted based on inner of a buckling check. And then we will add that skin to our stringer for the purposes of resisting the compressive load. Then we will calculate the Euler-Johnson allowable. And that will conclude our assessment. So we start by getting our properties of the section. We have two little flanges. We can assess them here and calculate the properties. We then will calculate, now that we have the A and the I, we can calculate the radius of gyration, which is the resistance to that bending, buckling behavior. We can calculate our Euler buckling equation. We actually don't need to do that anymore because we will get this straight out of the Euler-Johnson equation. This would be our allowable if all we were considering was Euler buckling, 60,000 PSI, or 11.7 kips. Now, if we go on, we can calculate our crippling allowable in this manner using the Needham method, and we find that our crippling allowable is about 46 KSI, so we see that this part would have buckled at 60 KSI, but it cripples at 46 KSI, which is dominant. However, we now can go and calculate our effective width. We do that by plugging into our equation. Remember, this equation that we're showing here could have put in FCY if we had no better information, but since we have the crippling allowable, that is better information than FCY, so we plug that into this equation to get a very good estimate of the effective width of skin as 1.429. We then can calculate our inner buckling allowable for our fasteners, and we find that that's 43 KSI. Since that is less than FCC, we need to adjust our effective width as we see here on the last line, and we find out the true effective width is actually 1.343. Now, we don't just calculate that for the heck of it. We need to actually now use that. And since that's acting with a stringer, we can use that effective width to increase the area and the moment of inertia of the stringer. We can do that like this by just constructing another table. Now we have, if you look at the left, we now have th uh, two elements. One of them has two elements, so a total of three elements. We have two sub-elements for, for the angle and one element for the skin. Now we could, to calculate these properties, we could make a table with the three lines, one for each flange and one for the skin. However, since we already have the properties of the stringer itself, that little angle stringer, we can just plug in those properties in line one. We already have them, being sure to carry enough digits. We then add the skin to it. Now the tricky part here is you got to be a little careful in that 
remember when we calculated these properties before, what we had was our stringer. And what we did before was we were using this as our y for our calculation before. But now we have a skin and when we draw our new section with the effective width on it, we now generally would measure y from down here. So when you plug in the information in the table, either you need to shift the two y bars for this section or the y bar for this angle section upward by the thickness of the skin, or you need to define the other thing you can do is keep the same reference, but then when you plug in this skin into your table, you're going to list its y bar as negative t over 2 because that center of that falls down below where our reference was. So if we look here, we see that actually what we did looking at this number here is we shifted up the y bar that we had of our angle by that skin dimension, by that extra uh, thickness of the skin, 050. And then we just plug this in as a positive number. So what that means is for this one, we refi redefined our y bar from the below the skin. Either way is fine, just need to be careful to be consistent. That's going to give us a new y bar because you're going to see the y bar of this angle was somewhere here, but once we account for this skin, it's going to pull it downward a little bit. That gives us a new y bar. It's going to give us a larger A because now we have all of this area acting, and it's going to give us a larger I. That gives us a new radius of gyration, which gives us an even larger buckling level, which now changes. Now it looks like it actually went down because the stress dropped. But remember we have more area and the skin wasn't the stiffest piece, so that makes sense. If you multiply that by the new area, you find out we actually have an increase in compressive allowable. And you can see that by looking at the compressive force allowable. Okay. But this is still just Euler. Now we don't even need to check Euler. Remember, all we need to do is check FCC first. We calculate our effective width. We adjust, we'll call that effective width prime, we adjust effective width by accounting for our F in a rivet buckling. We calculate new properties, I, A, and Y bar. And then there's no need to check Euler buckling because we can just go straight to our Euler Johnson allowable, which even though that is actually a co compressive allowable, we can call it F critical. In this class, I'm going to use FEJ most of the time just to emphasize the fact that that allowable is the Euler Johnson allowable, which accounts for both Euler buckling and crippling. We now are ready to calculate Euler-Johnson allowable, which means we plug in our FCC and the other information to calculate our allowable. We find that the Euler-Johnson allowable is 35.9 KSI. It's useful to think about these results. We had a crippling allowable of the stringer alone, and that was about, what, 46 KSI or something like that? We find that our, once we've accounted for the effective skin, we find our Euler, our Euler buckling allowable was about 51.1 KSI. Okay, which means Euler buckling was less critical. Our crippling is dominant because we have a thin section. That makes sense. Our column is 18 inches long. with some skin attached that's 18 inches long in compression. We have a uh, Euler allowable which says how it buckles like this and we have a crippling allowable which says 
how it locally buckles. But then we find that our Euler Johnson allowable is actually 35.9 KSI. It's even less than either of these. What that means is it would have Euler buckled at 51 KSI. It would have crippled somewhere before that at 46 KSI. But when you account for the buckling and crippling happening together, the true allowable is something a little bit less. Those two failure modes work together to cause a worse failure. This is what we saw on this curve where we transitioned from an Euler allowable to a crippling allowable. And we're going to find we may get something less depending on our slenderness ratio. Something between Euler buckling but less than Euler buckling and better be less than crippling because crippling is also a cutoff. So Euler buckling is a cutoff out here and crippling is a cutoff here so our Euler Johnson allowable should be somewhere below both because it's designed to be the Euler curve out here and to be crippling out here such that we're going to always get something a little less and that's what we see and that makes sense but it would be a little conservative to only use the properties of that stringer alone since the stringer is attached to continuous skin using the effective width is completely acceptable in fact that's the best way to do it and when we calculate our effective width remember we use that to stiffen both the A and the I and accounted for the change in the Y bar based on that skin that's how we can evaluate the compressive allowable of our stringer anytime we have a stringer Anytime we have a compressive member, we're going to look to see if there's a skin that we can use to bolster the properties. We're going to calculate the, oil, the crippling allowable and the Euler-Johnson allowable. And if it's a plate, we'll go back to our plate buckling approaches. That's it. Nice and simple. This is important. This is used a lot in industry. A lot of folks in industry are aware of this and use this. There are many folks that uh, overlook this and just look at column and crippling kind of failures. But Euler Johnson makes you a little stronger and this is something that you can use, uh, I won't say every day, but frequently in your career if you go into engineering stru aerospace structures or really any other kind of structure that uses lightweight sections like we tend to use. Enjoy. Merry Christmas.